It's a nightmare scenario. Stranded in the middle of the ocean with no power. Hi, my name is Andy Clark and I'd like to show you some basic do's and don'ts on how to look after your outboard and save money on your repair bills. Now, after 25 years of repairing outboard motors, I've serviced or repaired over 15,000 units, at which point I lost count. Now, I never spend a day in my workshop without learning something new. Now, the combination of innovative design and experience has led these machines to being very reliable, but they're frequently used in the most challenging environment we know, the sea. Damage that can be caused by seawater is more than a match for any manufacturer's product, no matter how carefully made and designed it may be. With a little care and attention, however, we can keep deterioration at bay. So let's have a look at how to take care of these machines so that you can avoid finding yourself drifting helplessly towards a watery grave. This is a modern outboard motor. This is a Mercury 54 stroke. These engines will give long service, provided they get a modicum of care. There are three ways of looking after the engine. You can give it to your mechanic, but we are notoriously expensive creatures. You can run the motor till it dies, but that will mean a breakdown at sea, which is very undesirable. Or you can repair the motor yourself. So we'll have a look at the motor now and the various components that need servicing. An outboard motor consists of four major components, the first of which is the power head. Inside here are lots of whirring parts that uh, provide the power to the leg. We have ignition coils, a fuel pump. Being a four-stroke, this has a camshaft. There's a starter motor, a uh, voltage regulator, and an oil filter. The crankcases are mounted on the next component, which is the leg section. The leg section consists of an exhaust pipe, a saddle assembly, which bolts the engine to the boat. And within this saddle assembly on this motor, is a power trim mechanism to enable the engine to be lifted up and down hydraulically. And the third component is the gear case. In here we have a 90 degree transmission, a water pump mounted at the top of the housing, and of course the propeller, which gives you all your drive. The fourth component is made up of a collection of external services. There's a fuel system, instrumentation, a battery, and controls. Bear in mind, an outboard has no superfluous parts. An engine can be severely compromised by the failure of the smallest bit. If cow latches are allowed to seize up, when you have to make an emergency repair, you may not be able to remove the lid. On a boat bobbing up and down in the sea, with cold rain lashing onto your face, that can make life extremely difficult. Thoroughness in servicing a motor is vital. Items such as cow latches, thumb screws, tilt support brackets, and tillers all contribute to problems caused through seawater ingress and it's worth making a list of these items and check them off as you service the motor. So that's all the main components that an outboard motor is made up from. Now we'll have a look at the top 10 faults. Number 10 is accidental damage. A lot of damage is caused to outboard motors from being dropped. When you carry an outboard motor, I strongly recommend that you, if you're right-handed, put your left hand under the front of the cowling like this, and your right hand under the leg. This enables you to hold the motor close into your body, and will avoid your knees from banging into it as you walk along, and save you from having a trip. There's a lot of delicate parts on an outboard motor. Catches, tiller arms, fuel taps and choke levers, gear levers, thumb screw handles and propellers. All these items object very much to being dropped onto concrete. Another thing that causes problems to outboard motors is them being dropped off boats when they're being lifted off the back by a squiffy yachty. You'll often hear this anguished cry as he lets go, followed by a splash as the poor old engine takes a drink. A useful tip when you're loading your car is to lay the outboard motor in on the side away from the gear lever. Rest the power head on a soft blanket or a cushion and try packing your luggage in around the cavities. There we are. And that's a happy outboard.
9. Seat steering. If you leave a boat over the winter, salt water droplets left on the steering shaft will dry and cause this to seize. You can avoid this by putting some two-stroke or gearbox oil onto the shaft at regular intervals, which my assistant will now do. I don't recommend using grease on the steering cable because that can attract sand and grit and will actually turn into grinding paste and turn into a very poor lubricant as a result. Number eight, waterway blockage. This is a little cylinder head from an even route four. Saltwater's ability to find any cavity and block it is remarkable. This little engine has had seawater dry in it, leaving these deposits. This stops water from traveling around the engine and cooling it. That'll result in broken piston rings and all sorts of other damage. Fresh water can also cause a problem. Some freshwater engines we see have so much lime scale in them that they look much the same as this. Cooling water can't travel around them, which is catastrophic to the engine. There are two ways to clean out a problem like this. You can see how heavily infestated this waterway is. The salt has built up and will prevent this engine from cooling to the point where you would break a piston ring. But the best way to clean these out is by bead blasting. Here we can see the bead blaster in action. This is a device that fires glass at high speed at the metal. It doesn't hurt any of the aluminium but it cleans it right down to its base. Here we can see the before and after effect. The glass bead has cleaned the casting perfectly right down to the bare aluminium. Glass bead doesn't cause any problems afterwards with painting or with future corrosion problems that some kinds of bead can. A glass bead cabinet is something that's within the reach of most people. A cabinet like ours costs about £180 and all you need to do is find somebody who'll lend you a compressor that you plug it into. Here we have a fine example of a redesigned propeller. This is normally caused by the nut that holds the steering wheel failing to realise that it is now on dry land. And as you can see, the propeller blades have suffered quite badly. These can be rebuilt, usually up to about a dozen times. The blades are welded back to their original shape and then reformed on a dolly. The other damage that can occur to a propeller is this rubber bush. This is designed to grip the outside casting and in the event of an impact underwater the propeller blades stop turning, the shaft continues to spin and when you're free of the obstruction the rubber bush will grip the outside casting again and off you go. This rubber bush will eventually give up. The symptoms will be much like a motor car clutches when it's slipping. As you apply the power the motor RPM will increase but drive will decrease as the bush slips. At that point you can either have the hub replaced or you'd have to buy a new propeller. Number six is component seizure. Salt water will seize everything from nuts and bolts to drive shafts to bushes. This particular motor has a seized drive shaft in the crank. Very hard to correct. It will probably necessitate the damaging of one or another components to try and save the engine as a whole. Here we have an example of a seized bolt. Salt water has stopped me from undoing this one completely. <coughs> that will snap. After the application of a little heat, we have the bolt out. Now it can be seen that the heat applied to the outside of the casting enabled me to remove the whole bolt with the thread intact. This doesn't always work, occasionally the box will snap in which case they then need to be drilled and the threads recut.
In fifth place, we have recoil failure. This little unit causes more trouble than it's worth. Things that fail are the little pawls that grip onto the flywheel, the main spring underneath this casting, and of course the cord. If the cord gets furry, it's time to be replaced. But the area where the cord is most likely to break is right at the root. And if we extend the cord, pull the first couple of inches out from the casting, and check to see if there's any excessive wear here. The main spring will sometimes snap if the cord is fully extended and allowed to go back in without assistance. That puts a lot of shock on the spring as the handle comes against the stop. This will either cause that spring to snap or distort. Some recoil start mechanisms require very careful setting up. This particular one should have these little words, arrow here, rope recoiled, lined up with a little arrow on the casting when the rope is fully home. As you can see, this one needs a little adjusting. This enables you to get the most force to start the engine with the help of this special shape around which the rope sits. This means the point of maximum leverage coincides with top dead center on the motor where the compression is. In fourth place, we have water pump failure. Most modern outboards have a water pump situated on the drive shaft just above the gear casing. The only modern outboard motor that doesn't have a water pump is the Honda 2. And if we remove this water pump, we can have a look at the impeller, which does all the work. This is the small device that pumps water up to your motor. And there are two main areas to look up for. One is broken blades, and the other are the seals at the top and the bottom of the impeller. These little ribs are very important. If they're worn out, you'll be losing a lot of pressure by water slipping underneath each blade, or above them if the top seals have failed. This particular one has got a considerable amount of wear in the middle of each of these seals. Another thing to check is if a blade is straightened and you can still see the creases in the blade, it's time for a new one. If the blades are missing, then need I say more. However, if there are any blades missing, you have to find them. The reason for this is this little blade will be pushed up the water pipe and could easily block the power head at the top. Your whole motor depends on this component, so it's very important to be fussy with this. The other areas on the water pump to look at are the cup. The impeller runs inside this cup. If a groove has been worn inside the stainless steel, then it would need replacing. And likewise for the stainless steel plate that lives underneath the water pump impeller. If that's heavily grooved, that should be replaced also. Most water pumps are available in a repair kit in which you will get a replacement cup, plate, a set of gaskets, and an impeller, and they're usually better value for money than just buying one component on its own. At number three slot, in our most ten common faults for outboard motors, are electrical connection failures. Most modern outboard motors use very reliable connectors. They're nicely made and they're well soldered, but salt water gets in everywhere in the end these little terminals will rot out and cause all sorts of problems. Components such as relays need to be checked every now and then to make sure the spade terminals inside aren't covered in verdigris and aren't corroded away. It's a very good idea when you're putting an outward motor together to treat yourself to a tube of dielectric compound. This is a special kind of grease that enables you to lubricate and seal components by applying a little to the seals here. It won't compromise the electrical conductivity, but it will seal the component and make it easy to dismantle and reassemble. The same goes for spark plug caps. If you apply a little of this to the porcelain section of the spark plug, you'll be able to pull these on and off quite easily without damaging anything. 
Eventually, salt water will start to damage starter motors and anywhere where there is an electrical terminal. This terminal here has a covering of liquid electrical tape. This is a neoprene tape applied with a brush that dries to a good airtight seal. And anywhere where you have connections on an outboard motor like this earth strap bolt, apply a little of this and it will make the life of that insulated terminal last greatly longer. Wires that run very close to the outboard should be checked quite regularly for overheating. If they're close to the crankcases and you've had a water pump problem, they could easily have melted the insulation on the wires. Likewise ignition coils. If ignition coils are bolted straight to the motor, heat can sometimes be transferred through and will melt the plastic shoes at the end of the coils. Number two on our list of 10 most common outboard faults is the fuel system. Outboard motors have a fuel pump, several fuel hoses, a fuel filter, one or more carburetors or a fuel injection system, an external fuel hose leading to the fuel tank with a barb in it, and the fuel tank itself. The most common faults with these items are the fuel bulb starting to age and crack, the fuel hoses themselves can start to split. Carburetors have many small components in which can fail. Filters often block up with bacteria, especially in two-stroke outboards. And the fuel pump may have diaphragms in which can split or crack. And number one, the granddaddy of all outboard motor faults is the fuel itself. So you've bought your five gallons of very expensive fuel and you've now put your fuel tank in your boat. All well and good. The trouble is, the moment you put this into the boat, the fuel starts to deteriorate. For a start, water can get in, especially if this is in an exposed position. It'll find access through the ventilation hole on the fuel cap and condensation will cause water droplets to form, especially in steel tanks. The other problem that occurs to fuel is that if it reaches a point of 10 to 12 weeks old, it will start to turn to varnish. The shelf life of fuel, especially with two-stroke oil in it, is very short. Certainly fuel should never be used the year after it's bought. And in springtime we have a lot of boats every year that won't run properly because of old fuel. The other problem with the fuel is that the water droplets will find their way through the system to the carburetor and turn it off. Water droplets can't be drawn through jets. You can avoid this problem by fitting one of these. This is a water separator filter. Fuel is fed into one side and out the other. The mesh inside will stop water from passing through. That will save you from a breakdown. And remember, when you're using an outboard motor, even if your engine's got oil injection, many oil injected motors actually only pre-mix the oil for you in the motor, so that the fuel that's going into your carburetor is much the same as on a petroleum motor. It will turn to varnish eventually, it will gum up the carburetor and it will stop the engine working. We get more fuel system faults because of the fuel itself than all of the other problems that we've described with outboard motors put together. <laughs>